September 10th, 1814. Just two weeks earlier, Washington was decimated, its army virtually non-existent. The destruction of Washington has spread fear over the Chesapeake Bay, especially in Baltimore, a city the London Times calls a nest of pirates. And it's from here that the privateers, those little sailing ships, have gone out to seize British ships so that the captains and the crew can uh, get the prize money. And that's why this city is deliberately targeted by the British. Baltimore had seen violent anti-war demonstrations two years earlier, but now the city finally galvanizes and prepares for an attack. Soldiers hoist the new stars and stripes over Fort McHenry, capping the defensive preparations of Baltimore. As the largest flag in the country, it satisfies Major Armistead's order. The British will have no difficulty in seeing it. By 10 o'clock p.m. on September 10th, the city settles in, the entire area shrouded in an eerie silence. Everyone in Baltimore is aware of what is at stake. Now, the only thing they can do is wait. At noon, an alarm cannon blasts a warning to the city, shattering the quiet of a Sunday afternoon. Lookouts have sighted the British fleet off North Point. Some citizens respond in panic. Others rush to defend the city. The British invasion force continues its combined naval and land attack on Baltimore. Their battle plan suffers a significant early blow when a bullet from an American sniper kills General Robert Ross. The loss of their commander has sent shockwaves through the British Army. Ross is temporarily replaced by Colonel Arthur Brooke, an able but cautious leader. The British quickly realize that this will be a very different battle than the one just a few weeks earlier. Dawn, September 13th, the bombardment of Fort McHenry commences. From their position two miles away, heavily armed British bomb ships unleash an early 19th century version of shock and awe. This is the most powerful destructive force known to man in 1814. 1,500 of these are thrown at the fort, exploding 190-pound cast iron bombs. This is what's striking fear into the hearts of the Baltimore defenders. Miles from Fort McHenry, the citizens of Baltimore feel the power of the British artillery volleys. A local newspaper reports. The houses in the city were shaken to their foundations. For never, perhaps from the time of invention of cannon to the present day, were number of pieces fired with so rapid succession. Eight miles away, a 35-year-old Georgetown lawyer named Francis Scott Key watches the bombardment aboard an American truce vessel. Just prior to the battle, he had arrived at the British fleet in Chesapeake Bay to secure the release of a friend. But before they can leave, the bombardment of Fort McHenry begins, and they're trapped. Key now finds himself in the middle of the storm. Francis Scott Key is amazed and appalled by the bombardment that's going on. The absolute foundations of both Fort McHenry and Baltimore are being rocked by these 200-pound bombs that are being hurled at the fort. As the Royal Navy bombards Fort McHenry, Colonel Arthur Brooke resumes the infantry attack on Baltimore. When he comes on the position in Hampstead Hill, he is amazed at what he sees. Strongly emplaced American troops behind extensive earthworks, well armed with artillery. While the British infantry advance on Baltimore, the bombardment of Fort McHenry continues into the afternoon. Heavy rain and 13-inch mortar shells deluge the fort. At about 2 p.m., a mortar shell arcs over the walls, killing a gun commander and wounding several soldiers. Private Isaac Monroe recalls the devastation inside the stronghold. 
Sergeant Clem was killed by my side, a bomb bursting over our heads. A piece the size of a dollar, two inches thick, passed through his body. Moments later, a bomb makes a direct hit on this powder magazine, where over a quarter of a million pounds of powder are being st stored. This is the main powder magazine for the defense of Baltimore itself. If this goes, the entire fort will go. If the fort goes, the city may very well fall. But miraculously, the shell fails to ignite, saving Fort McHenry from utter destruction. Despite the unprecedented onslaught, American troops inside the fort counter the attack with lethal force of their own. By nightfall, the bombardment has lasted more than 12 hours. The sky over Fort McHenry is ablaze with lightning and rocket glare as deafening thunderclaps and artillery blasts shake and rattle all of Baltimore. One U.S. Marine is awestruck by the dazzling but deadly sound and light show. I think the handsomest sight I ever saw was during the bombardment, to see the bombs and rockets fly. An order comes to extinguish the lights in all of Baltimore to prevent the British from seeing any strategic landmarks. Now, only the periodic flashes of lightning and exploding rockets illuminate Fort McHenry. Inside, Major Armistead and his men know they must hold out. The fate of the city, perhaps the nation itself, is in their hands. The only way Francis Scott Key and the people of Baltimore will know if they're successful is if the flag above the fort still waves. They watch, hope, and wait. Throughout the night of September 13, 1814, the British Navy keeps up its bombardment of Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. One British midshipman recalls the relentless artillery attack. All the night, the bombardment continued with unabated vigor. The hissing of rockets and the fiery shells glittered in the air, threatening destruction as they fell. Whilst to add solemnity to this scene of devastation, the rain fell in torrents. The thunder broke in mighty peals after each successive flash of lightning. Inside the fort, with the smaller storm flag now flying above, Major George Armistead's men return fire. The only means we had of directing our fire was by the blaze of their rockets and the flashes of their guns. Those citizens of Baltimore who haven't already fled the city look on in awe and horror. And Francis Scott Key is one of them. Throughout the night, he paces the deck of his ship in the darkness, hoping the explosions would continue, because if there's silence, it might mean the fort had capitulated. While the Royal Navy shells the fort, Colonel Arthur Brooke, commander of the British Land Force, prepares a final attack on Hampstead Hill on the edge of the city. To aid Brooke, Vice Admiral Cochrane orders a diversionary attack against the western slope of Fort McHenry with a flotilla of 20 barges armed with artillery. But the Americans don't fall for the ploy. Instead, the American artillery pounds away at the diversionary force. In the pre-dawn darkness of September 14th, Brooke makes a momentous decision. He orders a retreat back to the ships. September 14th, dawn. At 4.30 in the morning, the American gun batteries here at Fort McHenry fall silent. But the bombardment continues until 7.30 that morning by the British Royal Navy. And then after 25 hours of intense bombardment, Silence covers the waters of the Patapsco River and Baltimore Harbor. That silence follows the order to stop the bombing of Fort McHenry. The nighttime flotilla operation had failed. All the while, the ragged, rain-soaked storm flag still waves defiantly over the fort's ramparts. Cochrane understands that to continue fighting is futile. One by one, each British warship that only minutes before had unleashed an unprecedented eruption of artillery and rocket fire now weighs anchor 
and quietly sets sail into the morning mist. An American officer recalls the sight. The enemy has been severely drubbed, as well by his army and his navy, and now it is retiring down the river after expending many tons of shot, from 1,800 to 2,000 shells, and at least seven or 800 rockets. It is a moment to remember. It is a moment now that would define the importance of Fort McHenry in the War of 1812, because something is about to happen. Major Armistead quickly replaces the tattered storm flag by hoisting, as one British observer noted, a most superb and splendid ensign on the battery. The enemy has no trouble seeing it. But gradually, the morning mists began to clear. And once more, Key makes out the stars and stripes still flying above Fort McHenry. Never before has he looked with such reverence upon the symbol of his country. Francis Scott Key, a reluctant patriot himself, a person who was not terribly political and somebody who was against the war itself, finds himself an eyewitness to this moment in American history. I saw the flag of my country waving over a city, the strength and the pride of my native state. And does not such a country and such defenders of their country deserve a song? Key takes out a letter from his pocket and jots down a few verses. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. The British release Key later that morning. He returns to Baltimore and continues to work on his poem. What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. A few days after the bombardment, Key's poem, Defense of Fort McHenry, is printed on handbills and distributed throughout Baltimore. Whose broad stripes and bright stars, through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. The poem is put to the melody of To Anacreon in Heaven, a popular British drinking song from the late 1700s. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. By November 1814, the song is published in Baltimore as the Star Spangled Banner. Soon, other cities publish the song, and it gains popularity. Oh, say, does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave? Congress officially approves the song as the national anthem in 1931. Or the land of the free, and the home of the brave. The night of September 14, 1814, fireworks again explode and light up the sky over Baltimore, this time in celebration. So there were huge celebrations, you know, fireworks and dancing, and the best letter that was written at the time came from a lady in Philadelphia who wrote to her father, and she said, Papa, there are loud huzzas that hurrahs in the streets. General Ross is killed. Baltimore is saved. There were fears, she wrote in another letter, that the Americans might have to swear allegiance to the British crown again. That's how high the stakes were to some people. But an entire ocean away from Baltimore, a major development takes place that will affect the course of the war. British and American representatives begin peace talks in Ghent, Belgium. The first efforts to negotiate happened in the middle of 1813 when the Russians agreed to mediate a settlement between Britain and the United States. That didn't amount to anything. Uh, Madison had the commissioners stay in Europe and try to work on peace some other way. Both sides want to negotiate from positions of strength. To counter the growing American momentum, British Vice Admiral Cochrane plans an assault on New Orleans, the gateway to the North American interior. A victory there would allow the British to link up with Canada and control the United States from the north, south, and west. But one man stands in their way. His name is Andrew Jackson. <laughs> 